that strategic plan, we acknowledge that we need to enhance our strategic influence. We need the partnership of uh, various stakeholders if the very, very ambitious targets we set out there are to be achieved. And to be quite frank, there is no group more important to us as partners than the persons assembled in this room and the institutions represented. And therefore, we look forward to your cooperation as we pursue the strategic plan. I think we will we clearly agree it's in the interest of the, the, the financial markets of this country. And I think jointly, we can achieve great things. There are, I think, three issues we feel uh, are important. But the first one I think we need to work on is uh, further enhancing inclusive crisis management and resolution. I think at technical level, a lot has been done in our institutions, but of course we need to collaborate on that. The second one is uh, the establishment of a coordinated fintech facilitation platform fun functioning between our institutions for receiving and facilitating responses to inquiries and applications for approval of various fintech solutions. As uh, regulators, while we also you know, try to bring as much regulation to make the market free fair, we should also look at the costs of uh, regulation while we, do, while, you know, while, we, while we do that. I always say that the regulation, you know, we have too many regulations, but also to say that uh, we as IRA are looking at 19 pieces of regulations that are going to come up again. So the, the whole thing is uh, it's a balancing act in terms of how we, what's it called, uh, you know, how we support the market and also have regulation to make sure that uh, it works properly. The theme of this year um, definitely captures some of these emerging issues, uh, fintech, regulatory technology, etc. The proliferation of digital finance service providers offering a diversity of financial services, including credit, has challenged the traditional approach of delivering financial products. Equally, it has challenged us as regulators to rethink our approach. As financial regulators, it's a, a bigger challenge as we have to embrace innovations and ensure that the institutions can satisfactorily manage the attendant risks, which include, but not limited to, cyber insecurity threats and social engineering. The shift from uh, aid to trade and investment really gives us an opportunity to rethink many of the things that we do and how we do them. The shift from aid to trade. It's uh, especially in the context of the high fiscal deficit that we have, inflation, rising costs of, of just about everything, higher taxes, the VAT, which I don't know how we're going to go about that. But all of that reflects costs which we have to handle. And then also there's the caution to spend carefully. It speaks of the fact that continued reliance on donor and recipient relationships is no longer tenable. The shift signals that Kenya and the rest of Africa must now stand on their own as players in an active trade and investment, uh, competing and cooperating at the same time. As regulators, we are tied at the hip, and our work must be deliberate and innovative. We cannot leave anything to accident, because what will happen is that we are going to end up with very serious financial accidents in the light of the rapid financial transformation. We must take stock of our achievements in implementing the MOU. We don't want this meeting to be a ritual. We meet year in, year out without taking stock of how far we have gone in implementing the terms of the MOU. Execution is everything. But anytime you need information from Central Bank, you have to find the person who is clearing these things. 
saying talk to the manager uh, this or talk to so and so. Uh, maybe the other best way of explaining if if this is uh, IEBC trying to get information, uh, they send information to CID to help to carry and they are clearing houses. And last time what happened is some of these clearing uh, person here could even clear a certificate that doesn't exist. So someone becomes a governor and someone begins to ask uh, who was your classmate, he can't remember who it was. What we are proposing with this blockchain is to remove the clearing house and digitize the records. So if I walk to IABC as governor, I would permission IABC to, to check my records. I give permission that you can go to the schools I went, that you can go to KRA, that you can go to CID, that you can go to National Registration Board, you can go to Immigration, you can go to CRP and get that information. So he clicks the computer here, in one minute all that information is in front and they will tell me we are sorry, you never went to the University of Nairobi, so you don't qualify. So the decision is made there and there. The insurer, using what we call Internet of Things, uh, Internet of Things, Internet of Things, they gather data from grocery stores from all over, you know, they buy that data. So these guys, they go use their car to buy cigarettes and they smoke out there, and they come clean up their mouth there in the office. <laughs> So the insurer wanted to validate the information that had been given. They found this guy. These guys had bought more than a thousand packets of cigarettes. And that's how they came back to the employer. There was no whistle blower to say so and so smokes, but they lied. But they were found to have lied. The first intervention is the Capital Markets Development Master Plan. Uh, we are targeting four main countries, which is Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. Uh, the master plan is basically a 10-year strategic plan, uh, as we have had for Kenya, uh, we have had for Uganda and Rwanda as well. So we, we are uh, trying to duplicate the same kind of uh, intervention in other markets. Then we have the institutional capacity assessment as well, uh, where we are targeting six countries. Uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Rwanda. And, um, then we have institutional capacity strengthening, uh, where we are targeting two main markets, which is Kenya and, and Nigeria. So uh, basically, it's only about uh, building onto the institutional capacity assessment and going further advancing uh, into strengthening these regulators to now compete against the global standards and also. Uh, be in line with what we are seeing uh, global regulators are doing. So with the new technologies coming on board, like blockchain and fintech, um, that will also help in terms of um, the laws. And it's a um, regulatory framework that allows the innovators to test uh, their solutions in a confined space, in a confined environment. Um, we adopt what we call the um, blank sheet approach, right? which means we remove all the rules and start from zero base. Then we look at the business model of the fintech and look at the specific risks. And then we apply rules selectively that are applicable to address those specific risks. So to the startup, the rules are easy to understand and manageable, as opposed to the full suite of regulatory requirements which they will struggle. Uh, but because it's a limited uh, number of rules that we're applying, then I mentioned earlier that we have to correspondingly reduce the scope of the test activity so that if it fails, it fails safely. So there are some safeguards that we have in, in place uh, around that. Uh, we think this strikes the right balance of uh, uh, regulations that start off in proportion to the scale and nature of the concept being tested and can be stepped up accordingly when the business model scales. Uh, the fintech um, startup has a two-year period to test their solution, uh, after which they can either migrate to the full licensing regime subject to the full regulatory requirements or if their product fails to be successful after two years, they will have to cease their activities. Uh, so in one of our supervision of our um, 
you know, supervision of the firm if you do expect them to have a proper exit strategy and exit mechanism and proper disclosures to meet to the consumers. We have been able to reduce the infrastructure that we have as mentioned schemes because we have been able to outsource this uh, to the cloud. And this enables us to give services to our members like you know, online statements uh, that they can just get from their phones. Uh, we even have um, online voting because we have AGMs in pension schemes. And then we have schemes where no matter where you are, when the time comes for voting, you just go to your phone and you vote, even though you are not able to attend the AGM. So I think that is something that has been very good. Uh, for the members themselves, um, these new technologies can enable them to get a comprehensive picture of their you know, retirement position. Because members are in more than one scheme. They are in, you know, they could be an NSSF, they could have an occupational scheme of the employer, they could have an individual pension plan. I think this is a technology, blockchain technology that we can use uh, to get one uniform picture so that you know what is your overall uh, retirement um, uh, package. In terms of claims also, it will be very easy to be able to check uh, those claims once you have an incident that you require to make a claim, then you can strip that information online or through blockchain technology and you can be able to, to, to do it quite fast instead of sending assessors and other uh, government of people to go and look into those things. So the technology that is currently coming on and will continue to come on will be very easy for insurance business to be done. Data is the biggest commodity in the world and uh, we, we have to be conscious that even as you have more and more parties coming forward to offer clouds to service us and say we'll keep it off the continent for security, uh, let's, let's not be short-sighted. That they, if we give away our data, um, our positioning in the future will be highly compromised. And we need to look very critically at how we're going to make sure that we maintain control of our data and hopefully as Kenya position ourselves as the data hub for the whole region. If we all have the access to the same pool of information, why does everyone need to set and submit a separate report in a slightly different form to tell us the exact same thing? The cost of compliance that we generate in that, if we're able to um, leverage technology, can cut that straight out. So that information is available, we all have different interests in that information, we're able to access it centrally and then analyze and make decisions um, from that central core. FinTech presents that unique opportunity for circles that if we can get an answer to how can they share, some, uh, you know, for example, technology, such that regardless of where you are, you can actually, you know, be able to access it efficiently and you can scale up so that you focus on marketing your products, not worrying about technology, which you are told within a year it is again, you know, uh, obsolete. So we are looking at encouraging, looking at a framework, shared service framework, which we're exploring through that consultancy, that can actually give us very succinct answers as to what opportunity does the market see and what risks are there. The question is, what do you do when innovation comes to you, one way or the other? And frankly, we are not in the business, particularly ourselves in the center of we are not in the business of innovation and products and things like that. The industry is in the business of that. And it's our job to regulate it, knowing the risks. It's our business to know the risks and be very clear of what are the risks that we need to mitigate. Everybody knows that a lot of money is actually sitting, you know, under the mattress, under the pillow, whatever you want to call it. And that probably will not mobilize a majority of that money until there is something that actually resonates with you know, those people. So it's a, a quest to develop products and give them a framework, you know, where, give them an offer where that money is mobilized. Then also attracting for, you know, uh, foreign direct investments and promoting entrepreneurial culture within you know, the Kenyan society. And enhancing economic and trade relationships with you know, the partner countries. Now all this will you know, feed into bigger uh, objectives, if you want. And that is, first and the foremost, Islamic finance has to be totally inclusive for all Kenyans, regardless of their background, regardless of their faith. And they should be able to have opportunities from this. So whether it's entrepreneurs, whether it's individuals, whether it's businesses or bigger corporations or even the government or the county government or the national government, 
everybody should be able to benefit. We are having uh, consultations with the Securities Exchange and develop the processes and procedures of listing and trading Islamic finance instruments. Uh, in fact, we had a meeting to concretize our plans and develop a strategy as to how that is going to be done. The market size index combined of the three fully fledged commercial banks stood at 1.26 percent, while the net assets of the three fully fledged commercial banks were at 51 billion, which represents 1.28 percent of the total banking sector. In July 2017, the central bank commenced the review of the supervisory framework governing Islamic finance, and the CBK carried out a survey in the banking industry to assess one the extent of the current development, the challenges faced by the players in the banking sector, and to also see the outlook for Sharia compliant banking from the players' perspective. A consultative paper is currently being developed based on the based on that survey, a consultative paper will be developed to enable CBK to determine any necessary reforms and the way forward. We decided we need to come up with guidelines to address those unique features of TAKAFU. In 2015, we developed a guideline, TAKAFU operational guidelines, but uh, we had challenges when we went to the National Treasury because we were asked, where is it anchored? It wasn't anchored in our insurance act. So we had to go back and ensure that TAKAFU is in our main law which is the insurance act. So we commenced the process of recognizing TAKAFU in the insurance act, as well as giving the CS, that's the cabinet secretary, powers to issue regulations, which finally went through in 2016. Then we commenced now a journey because in the law, the CS was given powers to issue regulations and not a guideline. So we now started working on the regulations, and I'm glad to report that uh, we have draft regulations.